Bueno, muy buenos días a todas y a todos. Ahí estamos transmitiendo ya en el canal de Espacios Políticos de YouTube. Ahora en unos minutos tendremos aquí junto a, a profesor Alejandro Esteves, tendremos a, a profesor Rhodes. Y la conferencia empezará a las 12 horas de Buenos Aires, 16 horas del Reino Unido. Le digo a Chutnowski que entre, ¿querés? Sí, por favor. Ya le aviso.
Ahí está, ¿eh? Me voy a dar acceso a Roach. Estás muteado, ¿vale? ¿eh? Ahí estoy. Good afternoon. Hello, Rhodes. Uh, I've now got you on full screen. <laughs> Just a little picture before. <laughs> you have to turn on your web camera, please. Yes. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yes, of course. Okay. Yes. <laughs> nice to meet you. <laughs> now, now we are talking. Good. Let me introduce myself. My, my name is Maximiliano Campos Rios. I'm also a professor of the University of Buenos Aires with Alejandro. Right. Um, I want to thank you for your, your, your webinar of today. We are waiting uh, some minutes uh, for Mariana, who's going to, to make the comments to your presentation. Yes. Sure. And, then we are going to, to start at 12 uh, Buenos Aires time. I think that right there is, is 16, no? almost 16. Five to 16. 1600 UK time. Okay. <laughs> Very good. So, Rod, will you use a PowerPoint during your exposition or you want that we no. project your notes? I'm terribly sorry. I hate PowerPoint. <laughs> I mean, I, I get to talk to civil servants a lot, and okay. they absolutely adore PowerPoint. And they, put, <laughs> they put them up on screen, and then they read the PowerPoint slides to me. And I feel like shouting, but I can read it for myself. I don't <laughs> need you to read a PowerPoint screen for me. So I never okay. use it. But I do Don't do. be, don't be sorry I, for that. Don't be sorry. <laughs> All right, yes. not your fault. I've sent you my speaking notes. Yes, okay. We have your oh, notes. Cool. Yeah. Oh, so cool. online, yeah. We project your notes. There's yes. no problem. Yeah. And yes. they'll, be, they'll be much more used to the audience than PowerPoints. Okay. okay. Don't worry. <laughs> well, I wasn't worried. <laughs> the other thing is Mariana. Mariana. Being a typical. Mariana. Oh, sorry. Mariana is arriving. Oh, yes. Yes. Hello, Mariana. No. Hello, Mariana. How are you? Hi. Thanks. Hello. Nice to meet you. Hi. <laughs> okay. Okay. Mariana will so. plan your, your exposition, Rod. She's the commentator. Yes. Just, I understand so, that. Yes. So glad I've read all almost everything you have written, so I'm oh. very glad, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I am tempted to say that I'm not sure that even I could claim that. <laughs> I'm not read, I have not, I, I'm, I mostly read all your, your, your comparison and research design and- Yes, 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 yes. yes, yes. No, I, I joke. <laughs> As you will discover, I am fond of jokes. Okay. 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 <laughs> let, 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 yes. me alert, let me alert Mariana and, and, and Professor Roth that we are streaming direct on YouTube. Yes. yes. <laughs> Don't worry. Is that a joke? No, no. It's for no. real. It's for no. real. But, but we are going to start in a few minutes, maybe three or four minutes. Ah, okay. So we could become influencers. <laughs> yeah. And attract advertising. <laughs> that's that's like the the Oscar show, no? We are, we are going to to make yes. a, a scandal, and then we are going to 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 tweet about it and to, yes. to have a to go viral. Sure. <laughs> I hope Will Smith isn't lurking anywhere. Yeah, <laughs> my God, I'm so. Yes. In fact, that that was a powerful narrative, don't you think? Mm. Very powerful narrative. Yes, yes. <laughs> not quite, just not quite sure what the story is. Ah, uh, um, yeah, the old-fashioned. Yeah, story. that's right. Because if you invite Chris Rock 
to do that job. Inevitably, he is going to end up insulting people in yeah, the audience. Yeah. That's what he does. But he yeah. will do it well. <laughs> For me, more. Okay, I'm going to wait just for two or three minutes because I have something at the waiting room. So, Maximiliano, should I should I mute my? How, how is this going to work? Yes. Uh, I think that uh, Alejandro is going to present Professor Rose and you. And yeah. then we are going to, not, not yet. And then we are going to all listen to the presentation of Professor Rhodes. Mm -hmm. And then we are going to start with your comments and the comments of the audience. So uh, that's, that's the way we work as usual. If you have uh, some questions or some uh, comments about the presentation, uh, it's better to have a, a conversation, a fluid conversation, than the classic uh, questions and, and answers, answers and questions. So I'm going to start to admit. Okay, so I would that, mute my audio just in case. I'm going to. <laughs> We have two, two channels, this channel in, in Zoom, that is for a small uh, number of, of, of person who has um, uh, a registration. And then we have the, the, the streaming, but YouTube um, with more people right there. So, well, Alejandro, if you want to start, the sending Professor Roth is almost 12. It's one minute we have to, to wait. Okay. Very time. Good morning. Good morning or good afternoon to everything, to our public. Uh, we are in the pol public policy in context cycle. Uh, and let me introduce our guests. In first place, we have Roderick Rhodes. Roderick Rhodes is a PhD in political science from Essex University. He is professor of government research within economic, social, and political science at the University of Southampton. He's emeritus professor of politics at the University of Newcastle. He's life vice president of the Political Studies Association of the United Kingdom, a fellow of the Academy of the Social Science in Australia, and a fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences in UK. And also, we have as commentator, Mariana Chudnowski. Mariana Chudnowski is a professor in the Department of Public Administration at the Centro de Investigación y Docencias Económicas, known as CIDE in Mexico City. He holds a PhD in politics from Universidad Torcuato de Tela in Argentina, a master in politics from New York University, a master in public administration and public policy from the University of San Andres, and she is also a sociologist from the University of Buenos Aires. That's all. Uh, we have introduced our guest, uh, Rod. Please, you can talk. You have 40, 45 minutes to talk to us. There is no problem. We can be flexible and we can reach 50 uh, minutes. Is, there is no problem. Uh, so let's start, Rose. Thank you to be with us. No, no, thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, my discipline is usually referred to as public administration. And historically, it's a very conservative discipline. Uh, Frankly, for many of my colleagues, it's not only conservative, they see it as incredibly boring. OK, so it's not seen as sort of intellectual cutting edge of political science in the UK. Uh, that being said, I think there are a number of ways in which my discipline could be a tad more pioneering than it currently is. And what I want to do today is to introduce uh, a relatively novel approach. I mean, if you were in anthropology, this would not be unusual. 
If you're a sociologist, this is not unusual. If you're a political scientist, it's actually quite rare. People do not use ethnographic tools to study political science. So in that sense, it at least errs towards uh, novelty. And I want to provide a brief introduction to that approach. I want to <laughs> illustrate that approach by doing some case studies of uh, it in action. And I would, then I want to conclude by identifying what I think are the advantages of the approach. Let me stress instantly, it is only one possible approach. Like, like many men, I have an ego, and I'm quite prepared to believe that what I'm doing is pioneering, but I don't think it's the only way you can study my subject. I think there are other equally valuable ways. I just want to challenge people by saying that this is an important way. And I like to use the word storytelling because it frankly irritates my colleagues. Uh, they seem to think that storytelling is what you do with your children at night before they go to sleep. And indeed it is, certainly what I did with my children. Uh, but storytelling is also incredibly serious. In fact, we are a storytelling animal. We tell each other stories all the time. Sometimes we call it gossip, where we tell people stories which might or might not be true. Sometimes we call them narratives when we're being serious, and this is sort of a grand way of understanding the world. Sometimes we even call them meta-narratives, because narratives isn't grand enough. I don't care with, uh, for all of these grand labels. The heart of the matter is we understand our world by telling each other stories about that world. So what I'm trying to do is say, let's look at public administration, let's look at how government works, and let's ask a really dumb question. How do things work around here? And when you ask people that question, they answer it by telling you stories about how things do work. And that's what I'm after here. Of course, there is a theoretical label for all of this, and that's to call it the interpretive approach. And I have bored audiences for years now trying to persuade them that the interpretive approach is an extremely useful way of doing political science. The key thing about it for the purposes of this presentation is what I'm concerned with is what does this story mean to the people who are telling it to me? And what I'm interested in, I don't want to assume as many economists would, that they know what people's preferences, interests, etc., are. I want them to tell me what they're doing and why they are doing it. And I'm going to start from the proposition that in the first instance, I will believe what they tell me about their reasons. Now, subsequently, I will interrogate those reasons. I will ask, is this the right reason? Is this a good reason? Do they really understand what they're doing and why they are doing it? But I want those reasons to be the subject of investigation, not something that I assume for the purposes of later analysis. Now, how do I get at relevant meanings? And the answer there is I adopt an ethnographic approach. And of course, <laughs> it's almost impossible to have a big word in the social sciences, which isn't instantly contested. So, I mean, what people mean by ethnography is in fact uh, a matter of considerable debate. Uh, what I mean by it is going into the field and immersing yourself in somebody else's world. And if I was an anthropologist, that would mean I would go to another country, I would learn the language of the people in that country, and I would live with them for at least a period of a year. But I am, in fact, a fat, comfortable, middle-class professional uh, scientist living in the UK who has no intention whatsoever inflicting such misery on himself. It's all very good for bright young postgraduates to undergo these rites of passage, but this comfortable professor does not believe in doing those rites of passage, at least to himself. So I study people at home. I do ethnography in the UK, at least, or in the UK, Australia, and a couple of other places. Uh, I do not do it in the kind of trying environments that anthropologists like to inflict on themselves. So I am not immersed 24 seven in the lives of other people. I like an expression called hit and run ethnography, uh, which is you go somewhere for a couple of weeks, you leave, you go to an adjacent place for a week and leave. You go back to the other place for two weeks and you're in and out of several locations, several sites over a period of time. 
And the main study I will talk about today, uh, I was in and out for a period of two years. Uh, and I did a fair amount of observation in that time, but uh, it was not the total immersion which anthropologists uh, practice. It was hit and run ethnography. It's not the only version of ethnography that exists. It's not the only version of ethnography that I do, but all of the versions of ethnography share a concern with what people's actions mean to them. And that's what I'm after. Moreover, when I do it, when I'm trying to understand it, I collect the stories that people tell. And uh, I, don't know, I don't know how much, whether the phrase means anything. I'm a great lover of what's called posh gossip. In other words, it's the gossip between elites. What tittle-tattle do they tell one another? Because I find I learn a great deal about how people uh, behave and how they think about the world by listening to how they gossip. Now, let me say instantly, I'm, I hope I'm not completely stupid. I do not actually believe the, take the gossip at face value, right? The question is, why are they gossiping in this way? Why do they talk about X in this way? What does... To, what, what is the meaning of this encounter? Are they, is it a leadership bit? Are they trying to bring somebody down and take over from him by undermining them with these uh, awful stories? Or is it just, it's a very boring meeting and what the gossip is doing is making it more entertaining and more interesting and stopping people falling asleep. The question for me is how do I interpret this information that I'm collecting? And storytelling is for me, serious research. It might be a frivolous word. Uh, it might be a word that you associate with uh, domestic activities. But for me, it's an everyday word that most people do it most of their lives of explaining what uh, their world is like. The other word I like here is out of Levi Strauss. And this is the notion of bricolage. Uh, and I am using that phrase to mean that I am not wedded to any one research method. Any way I can get data, whether it's by uh, cameras, mobile phones, digital data, uh, historical ethnography, any method that gives me data on what things mean to people is valid. And so a jack, I'm, I'm a jack and a jill of all trades. I use any and every tool in my toolbox to collect the data. Now, again, that is not the same as mixed methods. Uh, most of my stuff would actually be quantitative, although I do do some quality, sorry, it would be qualitative, although I do do some quantitative work. But I don't want to get into a debate about this method is better than that method. What I'm trying to get at is any method that delivers me data on what things mean to people is a valid method for me. Now, that's all very abstract. Uh, and I think I can make it slightly more interesting by actually giving you a case study and some stories of government at work. And what I'm interested in is government elites. I've done two big studies, one of the chiefs of staff to Australian prime ministers, and the other one was a comparative study of British government departments. And I'll tell you some stories from each of them to illustrate uh, what I'm doing. Now, my, the big study, the, don't misunderstand me when I say my best piece of work. What I mean by best is the piece of work I enjoyed doing the most, right, was my study of the British government departments. So I will start with that one. And what I did was uh, eventually I managed to negotiate access to the top elite in British government. <clears throat> I was slightly lucky in being able to do that. I happened to know the top civil servant rather well, and we got on well. And slowly but surely, I got his advice on how to negotiate myself into government departments. It took a good year to get access. Moreover, once I got access, it was almost a continuous process of renegotiating that access because they're very sensitive little creatures and they get upset by oh so many things it's not true. So you've got to pat their fevered brows and stroke their hair, et cetera, et cetera, to keep them happy. Uh, and there's an awful lot of managing uh, people in order to stay there. And it doesn't matter. I mean, I dressed like my civil servants. Uh, they, well, you can see that I've got a black jacket and a black shirt on. I would have worn a fairly coloured tie because one of the markers of individuality public servants allow themselves is a colourful tie. OK, uh, or I had one public servant who allowed himself colourful socks. 
So he wore colourful socks. But the distinctive markers are actually quite small. You can't have anything too flamboyant. You couldn't go in in a yellow suit. That would just not be acceptable. I mean, I have a colleague, poor bastard, who wears a yellow suit. And we, we all look at him piteously for doing it. Well, no civil servant would dream of doing anything that outrageous. They're all very conservative. So I was very conservative. Uh, I think in, on balance, my hair was probably longer than the hair of most people that I saw in the government department, but they forgave me. And moreover, I didn't want to be confused as if I was one of them, because to some extent, I have to remain a little bit distant from them in order if I'm to make sense of what they're doing and why they are doing it. So you can imagine my horror on the first day I uh, arrive and I'm being taken round and the permanent secretary, the top civil servant, introduces me to everybody as his professor. Right? I did not want to be introduced as his professor. Frankly, I would have been happy if he had ignored me. But unfortunately, no, he wanted to show me off. And I spent most of my first visit to his department uh, persuading people to ignore me. I mean, the high status I strove for in that department was when the tea trolley came around with the early morning cups of tea, they actually gave me my own mug. At that point, I was no longer seen as being the outsider. I was a little token that illustrated I was an accepted member of the department. And at that point, I could, to some extent, breathe out and relax. But that's what I was, that's what I did for on and off for a period of about two years. Uh, obviously, you know, if you're a PhD, you've got the time. If you're a professor, you don't, because universities want you to do idiot things like sitting on committees and administering and running things. And I did all my fair share of those things. So negotiating the time out from the university at the same time as negotiating the time into the government departments was always a challenge. Now then, when I got in there, I didn't actually think about stories at the time. I'm probably being slow because I know, for example, the organizational sociologists have talked about storytelling for a long time. And here, what was I in a big organization? Uh, but storytelling wasn't something that in my head explained what public servants were doing until I heard them talking amongst themselves, where they would use expressions like, are we telling a consistent story? Have we got the story straight? or even more succinct, what's the narrative? Uh, they would use expressions which are associated with storytelling, like, have we got it all together? Right? Uh, and of course, we had a government, uh, subsequently we had a government which actually talked about its narrative and pronounced its narrative to the whole of the country. And I realized that in fact, storytelling was going to be central to what I was doing here. And it actually became clear quite quickly, once I'd latched onto the notion of storytelling, that it was used for many purposes. It was used to pass on information. Uh, for example, if a new person arrived in the department, one of the ways you'd socialize them into working within the department was to tell them stories about things that happened yesterday. Uh, you'd do it to inspire involvement, to get people to believe in the organization and to feel that they were part of the organization. It was also the organization's institutional memory. It was how it remembered what it did uh, years ago. Uh, and <laughs> I mean, I, this is going to sound weird. I went to one meeting there uh, and somebody asked a perfectly sensible question of what did we do last time? And nobody knew because nobody in the office had been there last time. And the only reason they were able to recover was they had a clerk who managed the filing cabinets, uh, of course they kept paper records as well as electronic records, and the clerk knew where the relevant file was. And that was the only person who had an institutional memory for how they dealt with the similar crisis before. Now clearly, storytelling is one of the ways you can have an institutional memory, provided, provided people actually stay in the organization. If they move on, they take the stories with them and they're not available to other members of the organization. So staff turnover becomes a major problem uh, for many organizations. Stories are also used to get everybody on board, to foster meanings, to get a sense of shared identity. I mean, I noticed, for example, when it came to the minister, 
uh, who is the top politician uh, in the government department, uh, they would tell stories about the minister which are almost reverential, okay? Uh, the pace of the office changed when he or she arrived in the department. Uh, I swear, and I mean, maybe it's my perception, but I swear they worked more quickly. And then when the minister left, the pace of the office slowed down because he was actually no longer there. Uh, and they would talk about the minister and tell stories about the minister, all of which emphasised his or her prominence and importance. What the minister wants is what the minister gets, was the kind of stories that were told. And it's also a shared language. I mean, again, this, <laughs> I, I'm not quite sure how these things translate into other languages, but one of the phrases which is used in British government is a chap. Is somebody a good chap? And is somebody clever? Now, those two expressions have a wealth of meaning in them. A good chap is actually a class uh, term. It refers to somebody who comes from a particular social background. I am not a good chap because I am from the north of England, which is where the peasants live. Uh, I am uh, provincial. I am regional. Uh, I am not from the southeast. I am not from one of the big public schools, so there's no way on God's earth I could ever become a good chap. I and mean, one of the things that good you can do with a good chap is you know you can rely on him, her. With the increasing prominence of women in uh, senior positions, uh, of course they weren't in senior positions when the word chap was first used, we now we talk of chapesses, et cetera, et cetera, to show how class actually competes with gender in this particular uh, context. Or clever, uh, I mean, given we're all from a university background, we think clever is actually quite good. If we say a student is clever or a colleague is clever, for the most part, we're actually praising them. But unfortunately, in the British civil service, it doesn't actually mean that. The colloquial expression is that he or she is too clever by half, which means they're too clever for their own good. Or it's a surface, cleverness, they're not deep thinkers. Now, what you're doing with these stories is you're decoding what certain expressions mean uh, and how other people will interpret what's going on within the organization. Now then, my best way of taking this forward now from those examples is to tell you a longer story about a minister that I was shadowing. Uh, the minister, uh, I'm not going to name him for obvious reasons, uh, was uh, very, self-important, frankly, uh, and uh, I, he took me around with him. He was very good, I appreciated the help, but when he took me around with him, I went in his ministerial car, because all senior ministers have got their own cars and their, uh, it's a mark of their importance. And we'd been off to a visit, it doesn't matter for this story, we came back and inadvertently, or at least I thought inadvertently, he left his coat in the car. So when he got back into the office, he noticed that he'd left his coat in the car. So he then sent his private secretary down to the car to collect his coat, to bring it back to the office, right? And we went out 10 minutes later in the same car. Now, what's happening there? And I think what the minister was doing, he was demonstrating to me, the outsider, how important he was by having these people at his beck and call, and he could send them off whenever and wherever he wanted to send them. Now, at this point, I was forming an adverse opinion of this minister. I thought he was actually, well, there are various rude English expressions to describe him, uh, and I will refrain, I will contain myself. They tell me it's on YouTube and you probably shouldn't swear on YouTube. So uh, we then went back to the car and we drove off to a conference center where the minister was giving a speech to a professional association. We land at the door and there is a red carpet on the floor. And uh, the minister had specifically asked for the red carpet. And when we get to the door of the building, all the officers of the association are stood there. They are quite bowing uh, to him like you would with the queen or the king who had arrived, but they're, all, they're being very respectful and they escort him into the building and they take him to his dressing room. Now then, I don't know how much you know about politicians and public appearances, but if you've ever been on camera, 
I mean, I can see that I'm doing it at the moment. You gleam. Uh, I'm not being rude or impolite to anybody in the audience, but everybody's got uh, oily skins to some degree. And under spotlights on a stage where you're giving a speech, it reflects back. And that reflection's picked up by the camera. So he had his large bowl of powder and a powder puff, and it was powdering himself down so he didn't glow when he was on camera. Now, most of them do that. It's not too exceptional. But then he did something very extraordinary in my eyes. And you'll forgive me if I digress very slightly onto my mother. Uh, my mother was a, a fund of little Yorkshire, this is the north of the country, stories. Not all of which made a great deal of sense to me, but you listened. Uh, one of which was, you knew that somebody would be hung for murder if their eyebrows met in the middle. So I hope none of you watching this have eyebrows that meet in the middle, because that means you're going to be hung. Uh, and clearly this minister must have heard my mother's story because he got a pair of scissors out and starts clipping his eyebrows in the middle to make sure they don't meet in the middle and then trimming them all the way along. In other words, he really was being an actor and preparing himself for the part he was about to play in front of the audience. So he emerges under spotlights. There are television screens halfway down the ginormous hall so everybody can see him, and he gives his talk. The talk is incredibly boring. He just reads an absolutely standard piece of political nonsense. And at this point, Rhodes is sat at the sidelines fuming. Why am I here? What is this idiot doing? This is an utter charade, et cetera, et cetera. But then I had to take myself in hand and say, come on, Rhodes, you're not thinking, lad. Step back from this. The audience isn't irritated by him. His civil servants aren't irritated by him. You're the only one who's irritated by him. Why? And I suddenly realized what we got here was a very common phenomenon in government. He was enacting the appearance of rule. He wasn't making decisions. He wasn't announcing policies. He was the public face of the legitimate government uh, inviting these professionals to admire him. Uh, and those professionals were willing to do that because they were so pleased he had turned up to their annual meeting and they were delighted he was actually there. He could have said rhubarb, rhubarb, rhubarb for 40 minutes, and they wouldn't have cared, because what mattered was that they had got a minister at their conference. What mattered to the minister was that he looked like the authoritative expression of the British government at work. And any substantive content in terms of policy, in terms of intellectual argument, was completely irrelevant for what was happening at this event. And the only thing that was wrong about this event was me, because I was allowing my prejudices and my uh, understandings of, of class, et cetera, in British government to warp my view of what was happening at this particular event. So what one of the things that you do when you're looking for the meaning of events is you have to dis distance yourself from your own prejudices your own way of looking at the world, in my case, a provincial, regional way of looking at the world, and try and understand why those professionals sat in the audience thought this was such a great event. And it was. And it didn't matter that he wore powder, didn't matter that he trimmed his eyebrows. What mattered was he'd got his adoring public sat in front of him. And this is not like a mass rally. I mean, you know, these are boring old professionals like me sat there admiring what's going on. So that's, that's the kinds of events that I was looking at, the kinds of stories that I was trying to collect, either looking at what other people did and writing my version of their stories. Now, that in itself is interpretive. Clearly, these are, their stories are not hard facts. They're something that I create from watching how they behave and what they tell me that they are doing. So it's my version of their stories. And those of you who've done any ethnography or any anthropology will recognize that that expression is in fact from the uh, cultural anthropologist, Clifford Geertz. Clifford Geertz talks about thick descriptions and writing thick descriptions, which is the posh way of saying you're writing stories. And in fact, there are other circumstances in which uh, Geertz himself 
talks about stories and plots, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But that was a that was a thick description of one very particular specific event uh, that uh, I observed whilst I was in the government departments. Now I'm going to tell, as there will be women in the audience, I'm going to tell a gendered story now, which is, is as much against me as it is against the civil servants, because again, it is a question of throwing your own into meanings out and trying to get at other people's meanings. And this was a very senior female British minister. minister. Uh, she was a very impressive woman. I was very impressed. Uh, and she had, uh, this is where the trouble starts, a beautiful wardrobe. She wore, uh, I say old clothes, they were, I can't remember what the expression is, but when you go to the 1940s and the 1950s, there was a whole style of women's dresses and she bought the, those dresses, reconditioned secondhand dresses, and she had a very distinctive style. She had an absolutely gorgeous uh, lapis uh, ring that she wore with it. And I wrote a section of it in my aim was to show what a powerful, impressive woman she was. But because I was doing it by describing what she was wearing, she seriously objected to what I had done, saying that I was trivializing her by focusing on her clothes. And I was crushed, absolutely crushed by her when she said uh, to me that uh, I thought this was a serious piece of work implying that by telling a story about her clothes, I was a very, very trivial person. Uh, I thought that was bad. It got worse. The then prime minister told her that she had to go to a meeting about Formula One. Now, like the minister, I too had no interest in Formula One racing cars. I could not be less interested in motor cars if I tried. If I made it a mission in life to be less interested, there'd be nothing left to achieve. Uh, but we went two and a half hours of complete and total tedium, listening to nothing but men rabbit on about cars. I'm sure most women in the audience will have been to a dinner party where they have had the singular misfortune to listen to men going on about their favourite hobby horse. She clearly, from what she'd said to me before, did not want to be there, was again absolutely superb at chairing it. Uh, she didn't play with her mobile phone. Uh, she did not look at the ceiling and stare around thinking, how do I get out of this place? Uh, she was a, the consummate professional chairperson for the event. And uh, she kept making suggestions to them like, I think we have to ensure that our suggestions are practical policy, i.e. that is just a pipe dream on your part and never going to happen. But they didn't read it. She read the meeting. They didn't read the meeting. Now, when I wrote this up, it was part of a longer day, I wrote it up as role playing by ministers. So she played the role of chair at this particular event very skillfully. When she went back to the department, the local business federation came in to see her uh, and they were utterly, utterly obsequious. They bowed, they scraped, uh, they couldn't have got further up her backside if they had tried. Uh, and it was actually quite embarrassing to watch them being so subservient to her. And then they went off uh, and she played queen. She played queen perfectly. Uh, they went off next income school children. She had fostered a day in which the, uh, the women on the staff brought in their grown up daughters, for example, ones who were doing the, uh, I don't know what you call it in uh, Argentina, uh, it's secondary school and it's the top grade in secondary school. And it was see powerful women at work day. And they came in to see her and they berated her over the exams they had to take at school. And she again handled that situation really, really well. And I was very impressed at the skill with which she could move from chairing an utterly boring meeting to uh, being worshipped by the businessmen, to looking after children who were visiting the department and slip between the roles uh, almost seamlessly. But again, when I wrote it up, it was actually interpreted by her, she was a bit sensitive, I thought, as me suggesting that she was in some way being inauthentic. That she was, because she was playing roles, she wasn't taking the job seriously. 
Uh, and so we had to have another discussion about how serious my research was. Uh, and needless to add, she was a fairly negative opinion. Again, I rephrased it when we went back. And at the end of the day, when she read the final manuscript, and thank you very much for reading the final manuscript, she decided that it actually it wasn't that bad and she could see why I'd done it, etc. But my point is, when you see people at work like this, you're actually looking in the minister's case, uh, the effects of gender in action. That my reaction to what she was doing and her reaction to what I was doing was influencing how I was interpreting the events going on in front of me and the events going on in front of me are inevitably gendered. Again, uh, the people involved don't always fully realize just how, what the impact of gender is. All ministers have got their own courtiers, a private office, and they're a mixture of political appointees and usually high fly flying, very talented civil servants. And it is frankly an awful job because you are with the minister 24-7. Uh, when the minister goes home, and if he, he or she will often go home quite late, uh, then that's when you go home. But you're not the minister. You don't have a ministerial house in the centre of London. You live out in the suburbs somewhere, which is at least an hour train journey to get there. And you've got to be back for six, seven o'clock in the morning. So, I mean, family life, they can't even spell it. I mean, they don't have family lives. Uh, one of the guys actually said to me, I think it's the fourth time in two weeks I've said to my friends, I will go to the cinema with you. And it's the fourth time I've had to call off because I'm still working. Now, change that to family life, put family life into that equation and ask yourself, how many women are there in this particular job? And the answer is very, very few. You, if you are a career woman and you don't want to have a family and you're not married, it's perfectly feasible. If you are a career, if you have a family, you can't do the job because you can't be there for the 18 hour day, which will be required and to be on call at any hour of the day when you are required. And so the actual way in which the work is organized around the minister is actually gendered from the very outset. And you have to behave, there's only one role you can play and that role is devotee of your minister or indeed the senior civil servant, permanent secretary. And it's two years of your life that you sacrifice to do it. And I wrote, and it's not actually in the book, I wrote a separate article with a colleague on the gendered nature of the way in which government departments are organized. And it's quite striking uh, how the workload is actually uh, quite gendered. And I have to say, when I started on my academic career, if you were a senior woman in the British civil service, and this is late 1960s, early 1970s, if you got married, right, you had to resign. You weren't allowed to be a top civil servant and a married woman at the same time. The view was firmly held that you couldn't do both. Now, that particular rule's gone, but the pattern of work organisation remains the same and it has similar kinds of effects. So when we're doing this kind of, this kind of work, uh, what I'm trying to do is, as, as I hope these little, as I hope you've realised what I've been doing is telling you stories and these are the stories which are told within the organization. You know, I sat and talked to career, young career civil servants who said, I am not going to into that job because I have a young baby. And that was the man speaking. OK, because they could see that the pattern of work was such that it did not admit of any serious kind of family life. Uh, so these are the stories that I'm telling you as if they're my stories, but in fact, they're stories that I gathered whilst talking to everybody in the department. Now, there are no, I did this, I collected these stories by observing people, by interviewing people. It's not the only way. When I did the, the Australian study, I did it by focus groups. I actually got everybody who'd been chief of staff to the Australian prime minister. And there are very many, I think mean, it was 17 in total, who were retired, whom, we, whom I could get up with my colleague, Anne Tiernan. And uh, we did two focus groups with them, uh, which were very good because if you know anything about focus groups, <coughs> you know it's not like an interview. So we weren't asking them questions. They were talking to one another and they were asking each other questions. So what you got was a group of seven or eight 
very, very senior political appointees talking to one another about what it was like to work for their prime minister. And it's, it's not immersion, it's not observation, but you are getting a lot of deep material on what it's like to be a chief of staff and work in that job. So that's focus groups uh, are an alternative way of collecting this kind of information. And a final way, way which a colleague of mine at Bath University used very successfully was questionnaires. And he administered questionnaires to people in organizations asking questions like, what do you tell your partner when you go home at night? And other, frankly, simple-minded questions, but brilliant for getting people to talk about what it was like to do their job. And so he picked up a whole battery of stories uh, along these lines. The question is, why bother? Why would you do this? I mean, apart from the fact that, I, at least I hope I've made it clear, but I thoroughly enjoy doing this kind of work. And I would be very disappointed if my PhDs uh, or my colleagues did not enjoy it, were they ever to do this kind of work. Uh, but apart from my personal pleasure, what's important about it? Well, first of all, it gives you data that's not available elsewhere. I mean, I discovered, for example, that the diary secretary uh, for the minister, who is always a woman, uh, and uh, it's usually seen by outsiders as utterly insignificant, just uh, a minion uh, who does a, a very routine job. And I would, you would be totally wrong. Uh, this minion, so-called, in fact, controls access to the minister. Even the top public servant cannot get in to see the minister unless he arranges an appointment through the diary secretary. And the diary secretary has the authority to say no, and often does say no. Some junior ministers in departments have thought, oh, I can just go in and see Fred or whatever. I've sort of marched in, and as one of them uh, mused sorrowfully afterwards, and I didn't see the minister for another six months because he couldn't get past the diary secretary. So that, I had no idea that diary secretaries controlled access and several other things. It identifies key individuals and core processes. For example, the principal private secretary is a high-flying young civil servant who uh, will... Uh, be on the way to the very, very top. And he or she is unbelievably powerful, although they are relatively junior. Because what they do is the minister gets a, a box of all the documents he's got to read, and there will be policy briefs. These are the policies they want him to make or her to make a decision on. The, peop the private secretary controls what goes into the box. If he says, no, the minister doesn't want to think about this now, your brief will never be read by the minister. Again, I had no idea that they could do that. It works the other way around. You also discover that there are voices in the organisation that uh, never get heard. I went to, as it's in the news at the moment, Chelsea Football Ground. Uh, the department had organised a big conference there to sell its new strategic plan to middle level managers. What I discovered when I got there was this was the first time, let me emphasize that, this was the first time that middle level managers had seen the strategic plan. Then as now, performance indicators were very important. And what the middle level managers said to the top brass was, I'm sorry, these performance indicators won't work. This performance indicator would be better. And they fell out because top management thought they were challenging the strategic plan and middle level managers thought, you're not listening again. And their life for them was a history of not being listened to by top level management, which of course makes it really hard to get everybody on side for a strategic plan. Uh, another advantage of this is it gets at the beliefs and practices of actors. It actually asks people, what are you doing and why are you doing it? It doesn't assume that you already know. It gets behind the surface of official accounts uh, and it provides texture, depth, nuance. So we know our stories uh, are rich and that more of those stories are loco located in a rich context. Uh, and that seems to me to be an advantage. Too often we generalize and by generalizing inevitably, it's the object, we simplify. 
And by simplifying, we take far too much out of the account. Uh, it admits of surprise. And it's certainly true that strange, strange things happen when you do research. Uh, and because you're sat with the people on a regular basis, and they're not formally uh, talking to you, it's not a questionnaire, etc. It stuff happens while you're there. Two things happened. I've mentioned one, I discovered that they were doing storytelling. The second thing I discovered was that parliamentary accountability matters. All of my teaching life, I have done British government and politics. It's sort of a uh, 101 course for British students. And in every one of my uh, British government and politics courses, I told students parliamentary accountability is a myth. And frankly, having watched the minister in action or the civil servants in action, that is complete nonsense on my part. That's just not true. Uh, because what I discovered was that in the minister's uh, office, there's a group of civil servants completely dedicated to answering questions from parliament. When a question comes in from an MP, a member of parliament, they will go tell the relevant section of the department to get the information together. They will drop everything to provide the information for that question. That information will then go back to uh, the central unit who will put it to the minister and that will take priority again over whatever else is happening because it, the prime minister will actually have given every department a turnaround time for answering questions. They all do it and great chunks of time are used up in my, you know, as an outsider, I would have said fruitlessly answering stupid questions from parliament. But you can't say that that isn't parliamentary accountability. If people have to jump when you ask a question, that is a form of accountability going on there, uh, which is taking up great chunks of time. You know, if people believe it to be true, the consequences are real. People believe parliamentary accountability mattered, so it had very real consequences for the behaviour of people in the department. That was a surprise for me. And it also, the biggest surprise of all, was I decided that what surrounded all of these ministers was the equivalent of a court. Just as kings and queens of yesteryear had courts with courtiers in them, so my ministers had a court with courtiers in them. And what you were watching was the kinds of intrigue and persuasion and argument and falling out we see in dramas like, oh, I don't know, Game of Thrones. I mean, they didn't actually kill one another and chop one another's heads off, but they were playing that kind of small interpersonal politics and it mattered, right? People got seriously upset, seriously hurt, seriously uh, disappointed if they didn't win the game of court politics at the center. They were all competing for the attention of the minister. If you got the minister's attention, you were winning. And so that's what uh, court politics was about. And it was played out in various ways in different departments. The most dangerous way I saw it was one department had a crisis and they retreated into the court and they only talked to one another in the court. And it was an absolute classic instance of uh, a group shutting down and closing itself off of groupthink, as it's uh, known, uh, in a government department, which is not a productive way of responding to a crisis. You need to reach out for information in a crisis. You don't close down in a crisis. But under threat, the court acted to protect its minister and to shield her off from what was going on around her in the department. So court politics was my absolute number one finding out of all this, and I use the notion of departmental court to describe it uh, uh, in, in the book. Now, all of those things, I think, come about because you are pursuing this kind of observational, interpretive approach to the study of government. Let me now go right the way back to the beginning. I am not claiming that the only way to study government is ethnographic. I am not claiming that the only relevant source of data is storytelling. All I want to do is to say that both are extremely valuable additions to our toolbox when we're trying to understand how government works and why things are as they are, okay? Uh, so it is, it's a, it's a big claim, but it's also not a stupidly immodest claim, all right? Because I think leaving people out of organizations in a mis is a mistake. 
So much political science uh, forgets to put the people back into the account. And what I'm doing here is putting people back into the, our understanding of government by focusing on what they do and why they do it. Thank you. So thank you very much, Professor Rhodes. This was a quite interesting lecture. And what I'm going to do now is ask you a few questions just to be sure we can listen to you a little bit more. And then- if oh, we... more? <laughs> yeah, I promise it's going to be very short. And if I, ha I already have three questions on the chat, but if somebody else wants to write a question, of course, I will gladly read it for Professor Rhodes. So let me just, okay, first a comment. I believe it's quite refreshing for a Latin American audience to recover this more social sciences based approach to political science and all this interpretive approach and uh, recovering people back and sociology and anthropology as a way of, of approach what you call, and to me this is key, storytelling as data, because otherwise there is this wrong notion of storytelling as, as something like opinion, and storytelling is a source of analysis. And I think that British political science or European, if you want, if you allow me to say, is quite more sophisticated in that sense. And here, at least in, in Argentina, but I think I can say that in all Latin America, we had a very strong influence of the more mainstream political science. And maybe let me, this is a kind of a joke, but somehow I think this is kind of right. It's more lead for by economists. So to recover sociology and anthropology is quite refreshing. And to understand that data, is also people's reasons to act is also key. So let me ask you two questions. Um, of course, British government is a more organizational, strong uh, state than Latin American states. Here we have like very stable civil services and low budgets and our turnover is very important. So people are changing all the time. The civil servants has very unstable jobs. So they have the challenge of like, try to stay there if the government change, but also stay there even if the government doesn't change because the rules are very like uh, precarious. So I was wondering like anthropologists always has dealt with the problem of reactive, uh, uh, methodological problem with researchers, but how do you grasp the real reasons of people who are working inside governmental organization when the most important fear is not to lose their job if they are in working on the civil service and if they are in the level of like the politicians or the political audience and also the, the, the need to, I, I don't know, to serve their political boss. So, uh, I can understand the problem of accessing government in general, but in our states, I, I, I don't know how to deal methodologically with the fact that ask people the reasons will be at least influenced by the fear of losing their job and the fear of the political like consequences to be nice. And the second one is all this storytelling approach and the interpretative political science, I think is fantastic, but we know the power of storytelling with the, in the wrong way also, like yes. in fake news and anti bugs and anti-science and everything. So how can we be sure to be in the correct side of the storytelling approach? That's the second question I have, and then I can read uh, the questions of the audience, or if you want, I can read it now, I don't know, Maximiliano. <laughs> you want me to reply to that, or am I collecting questions? Okay, no. you want me to read everything now? No, I don't mind. Yes, yes. I, I will do whatever, I mean, I, th I think probably better to break them into batches, yeah, otherwise. Yeah, let's, let's do that. Okay. Uh, right, let's put, um, 
one of the things I didn't mention uh, about my study was mm. that uh, before they let me in, I had to promise that everybody would be anonymous. So, <laughs> so I, I, it, it, I, once I'd been in there for a while and they decided I was sane and not an idiot academic, then some people allowed me to use their names. But for most people, I had to give a guarantee that I would never name who they were. Now, given your problem about people being worried about keeping their jobs, anonymity is the first line of protection for that. So the person is never actually named. Uh, some of them were very confident uh, and they didn't care, but others, I respected their wishes. Secondly, as a second layer of protection for people, because people can get fired in British government. <coughs> I mean, some people might say this is whistleblowing and we don't like whistleblowing, you're fired. Yeah. So, I mean, you, there's that issue. So the second one was I actually did not, I named the departments that I was visiting, but I did not actually name, I did not treat each department individually. I created a composite department. So I don't talk about, I mean, uh, it was the Department for Trade and Industry, the Department for Education, and the Department for the Environment were the three departments I was in, okay? But throughout the book, all three are referred to as the department. So the reader never knows which department I'm actually referring to. So between not knowing which department and individuals being anonymous, I actually got quite a high level of trust from my respondents. And most of them would talk to me. And the other thing, I mean, just for want of time, I mean, the other thing that happens is uh, the political advisors uh, have uh, a drinking club. They, there are favourite club, clubs in London to which they go. And when you've been around for a while, they invite you to the pubs. Now, every country will have its own cultural variation on the English pub where you go out with your mates, you relax, it's all very friendly, and you chatter away to one another. Now, I knew I was winning when I got invited to those contexts. Because at those contexts, they gossip with one another, they say things they shouldn't say, but that didn't matter so much. What mattered to me was the fact that, just the simple fact I had been invited. <clears throat> so the trust problem, I think, is easy to deal with. The stories as lies, uh, and we all know that politicians tell whopping great lies, uh, is to actually find uh, evidence against the story. And you have to look for evidence against the story. Uh, the analogy that I like is the one about lawyers in a court of law, where when they interview uh, somebody in the witness stand is called a forensic interrogation. I mean, we have to forensically interrogate the data that we collect and we have to ask, what is, is there another version of this story? Is somebody else telling this story but telling it differently? You cannot just accept the story as it is told to you by one person. But I, I freely admit, I'm not trying to claim that this is an objective process, I freely admit that at the end of the day, it is my judgment as to which version of the story is the more accurate one. I would just insist that any method of collecting data, quantitative or qualitative, always involves a substantial element of judgment. Yes, so I don't think I'm doing anything particularly outrageous in doing that, but I do have to be, because people are suspicious of doing this kind of research, I have to be especially careful in making it clear that I am being this careful when I am compiling my stories. Thank you so much, Professor Rose. I think this is very interesting and we can be talking hours about- <laughs> Can I make a practical comment about your very yeah. first remark about the turnover yeah. of staff? What we have, a, I'm sure it's not as acute as your problem, but we have a problem with turnover of staff in Britain, uh, where most civil servants will only stay in their post for two years. Uh, and most governments last five years. So that means one minister could have three top uh, officials working for them. 
and institutional memory gets shot to pieces in that context. It always baffles me why, when they're trying to do the reform of the public service, they never ever take steps to preserve and strengthen mm -hmm. institutional memory. It seems to be central to what all of them are doing from the storytelling that you get from people, it's clear that it's crucial for them, but it is never on the reform agenda where your country and my country both have a turnover problem. And this is so interesting and we should do, we should work on that. But let me tell you, I have three questions, but two comments are mm -hmm. from somebody who is like a woman talk here. So Oscar, how about, how about <laughs> Uh, so, Oscar, do you want to read your own question uh, or just to talk and introduce to Professor Rose? It doesn't make sense that I read your question. And then I could read with Maximiliano San Luis one. Oscar, hola, hola. Te queremos en vivo. No, you are mute. Please unmute yourself. We want your story to Te muteate, Oscar, please. Ya está. Ahí. No, the only thing is the technology. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yes. So, because I think that your your is so interesting. We, we want to hear you by yourself. Hey, you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, I would like to uh, to say hello to Professor Rose. Oh, hi, Oscar. I really enjoyed uh, your talk, uh, and I, I just uh, made a question uh, conveyed to you, uh, but uh, you can read it, uh, Mariana. Okay, so let me tell you, Oscar is giving you an example that Juan Carlos Torres, who is a great political scientist, has just wrote a book where he's telling all what happened inside government when he was working there a long time ago, and it's super interesting. And Oscar is asking you, what do you think about the relationship between the storytelling as a data from interpretive approach and the growing field of microhistory? And he thinks, I don't know why I'm reading really, it, he thinks there is strong Absolutely massive overlap. What he calls yeah. microhistory, uh, I call historical ethnography which is where you get first person accounts of what it was like to work in an organization. They come as memoirs, autobiographies, diaries, whatever. Yeah. And I, uh, well, in the jargon is a thematic analysis. You go through those texts looking for common themes that they share with one another. And obviously I'm interpreting the text to identify the themes and for example, one of the things I've been looking at uh, recently is the diaries of recent uh, prime ministers and their ministers and trying to identify what the common ground is between them all. And one of them that cropped up, which doesn't always forget, was humour. And the role that humour and, and jokes played uh, in their everyday life, in particular because, of course, it's frequently a way of relieving stress. Uh, and so, I mean... Can I tell the story? Uh, there's one particular section in it, which is very interesting. I get, I'm, in England, we have private schools and you pay a fee to go to them. They're elite schools. They are usually entirely male schools. There are no women in them whatsoever. So you can imagine that in that context, you get a certain kind of humor and certain kinds of jokes. The jokes <coughs> will invariably be homophobic, sexist and vulgar. Uh, one of the interesting features about one of the British prime minister and his cabinet was large numbers of them came from that background. And one of the ways in which they relaxed was to go back to those sides, those kinds of sexist jokes. So, you know, what, what, what you can do with looking at memoirs, etc., is you see spread across them a common theme. The common theme was humor, but it was also humor which was class-based because it came from a particular socio-economic background. Now, I suspect Oscar's mini histories and my historical ethnography <clears throat> are doing much the same thing. We are mining first person accounts for the everyday beliefs and practices of the people working in government. 
That's quite interesting. Okay, I have two hey, questions. I, I, I have to, that, that was heavily censored, by the way, because it's incredibly vulgar. May I introduce a very short story? Speaking oh. of stories. May I? Yes, yes, of course. Yes, you can do whatever you want, always. Okay. Because I realized that uh, I was probably using storytelling in one of my latest books, uh, which uh, is called La Trama Oculta del Poder in Spanish. It's uh, the hidden uh, network of power, which is a story about uh, the landowners, uh, the Chilean landowners' behavior in Chile during the agrarian reform process, right? So I went to Chile in the summer of 1969 to write my PhD dissertation. And 40, 46 years later, I wrote my book. Not the, <laughs> not the dissertation, the dissertation was, was another, another subject, right? <laughs> but I, I was privileged at that time to uh, be able to get to the minutes of the uh, landowners uh, association. So I was, uh, uh, I had the possibility to look over 15 years of minutes of every session, every weekly session of the landowners association. Wow. And used to write exactly what happens during the meetings, what, the, what every person had to say about the situation uh, either uh, having to do with uh, land reform or with prices or with the peasants or whatever, right? So uh, from these minutes, I was able to extract an incredible amount of information, right? And most of the books is a storytelling of what happened uh, during this, those 15 years of uh, meetings of the uh, main association of the uh, Chilean landowners, right? So uh, I, I, I devote uh, one section of my, of my book precisely to discuss uh, if I uh, really using micro history, because I, I was uh, sure, completely sure that uh, even, even though I never, I'm not a historian, right? I'm a political scientist. But uh, I was sure that I was doing some sort of micro <laughs> history or what you're calling the storytelling. So, so I just wanted to share with you this. Surely, uh, surely. I, I think it. I think it is clear we are fellow travelers, even if our labels yeah. are different. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Rose, we are way ahead, of, like time. But do you have five more minutes? No, no, you carry on, carry on. It's fine. Okay, so I, will, I will read the last two questions. So the first one is regarding the role of social networks. Um, and Luz wants to know what happens when there is a different like storytelling competing in social networks and what's the role of the of the government or the state there to introduce, to, to get involved or not, or what to do with what happens there. <laughs> and the second one is from Maximiliano, and he wants to know if the storytelling approach could help us to analyze the performative aspects of politics, not only the, po the policy process, but all the perception of different actors involved in the policy process. Sure. Uh, just on the social networks, are we talking about social networks within government or outside I'm government? I'm not sure, Luz. <laughs> Well, I'll answer it for within government, and if that's wrong, I'll do the outside government later. Within government, <clears throat> uh, the social networks were crucially important for the Cameron government, which was our Conservative government in the in between 2010 and 2016. Uh, and it was a very strong social network. Uh, it was one of the reasons why the government was relatively coherent, because this network share, had a shared story, and that was the austerity narrative. Uh, <clears throat> mistakenly, they believed that British government's finances were in a bad way because of the previous Labour government. Somehow, the world banking crisis and the collapse that followed that didn't affect, <laughs> had no effect whatsoever, a source of some amusement to me. Uh, but because it was a cohesive social network and because they believed this narrative, they were in a very powerful position to drive their policy proposals through. 
So social networks are absolutely essential to this. The difficulty for me as a researcher is I can track some of it, uh, but not all of it gets written down and recorded. And if it's not written down and recorded, I can't follow it. So that clearly is a social network. I've clearly got most of the key actors in it, but equally clearly, I have not got all of the actors in it, which is the limit to my kind of data. On performative, it's important performatively in two ways. The first of which is that uh, when you're watching people, if you treat it as being a performance, then you can ask all kinds of questions about how are they performing? What are the tricks of performing? What are the consequences of this kind of performance, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and performative ethnography is actually a little field all of its own. Uh, the second uh, area where I think it's important is it's one of the ways in which some of my colleagues have reported their research results. In effect, they have written them as a script, which in order to report the results to an audience, they actually perform the script for that audience. Now, I'm not sure I thoroughly enjoyed the performance that I watched. I thoroughly enjoyed taking having a part in one of the performances. So I'm not being wholly negative about it. Uh, and I thought it was a great way of engaging people to get them to go and read the book. But I wasn't sure that it provided enough data or analysis for, to convince me that the, their version of the story was, pers 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 was persuasive, okay? So yes, it's, it's one of the tools we can use. I'm just not quite sure uh, how good it is at analyzing the data. I think it's a good way of describing what happened. I'm not sure it's a good way of analyzing what happened. Can I go all the way back to Oscar and say, I think one of the problems is that he and I live in a world which has been dominated by American behavioral political yeah. science in which quantitative methods have been the gold standard for what goes on. Now, in my canon, right, I think, Clifford Geertz, the cultural anthropologist, is the best social political scientist of the post-war period, and most political scientists in America will have never read him because of this bias towards quantitative political science. Now, it's getting better. I mean, there are groups at the American Political Science Association. There's a journal which is much more receptive to different uh, where perspectives on political science is much better at accepting a varied number of articles. But still, the dominant tradition is this positivistic, naturalistic, quantitative tradition, with which I did for 20 years, but which I'm out of sympathy with now. So true. <laughs> yep. So. Thank you so I much. Yes, I guess this is everything. So thank you so much, Alejandro Maximiliano, for organizing this, Professor Rose for coming here, Oscar for participating. I look forward to- oh, Sorry, I couldn't come to Buenos Aires. <laughs> that would have been, <laughs> been much more fun for me. <laughs> yes, and it's so cheap now. You should come before we- <laughs> Yes, and I hope we will be able to meet each other in person someday if we, have a, world, very nice. if we have a world to do so and so this is everything thank you so much professor Roth, as always so interesting and challenging to hear you and that's it from me very good well thank you for inviting me i have enjoyed myself thank you oh, so thank glad. you all. and thank you alessandro for organizing it no thank, thank you. you thank you thank you, thank you, professor thank you. Great, great, bye. Great bye bye bye, -bye. Take care, bye, -bye. Guys. Bye bye. Bye. Take care.